So hello everyone, it's the Cricket Connoisseur here and welcome to episode 22 of the TCC Talks podcast. Now in today's episode I'm joined by someone who will be very familiar to any fans of associate cricket out there. It is none other than former Scotland and Sussex batsman Matt Machen. So first things first Matt, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today. How's your day been so far mate? Well, it's been very well, good thank you, very good. Um, thank you for inviting me onto the podcast and um, yeah looking forward to it. Excellent, good answer. Great way to start the pod. <laughs> but uh, yes, on, on the TCC Talk podcast, Matt, tradition, okay, we go all the way back to the origins of your cricketing journey, okay? So what was your first ever memory of cricket, either watching or playing the game? My first ever memory is, I think I was seven or eight, when I got invited by a friend to my local cricket club, which was Brighton and Hove. Uh, and yeah, went from there, really. Um, I remember turning up to the first net session, um, picture it quite well, really, considering it's so long ago. And just went there, really. I was probably quite uh, a natural sportsman at that age, um, had good hand eye coordination. It just kind of clicked and I loved it, really. So, yeah, that's my earliest memory. Many, many years ago now, it feels. But, yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, pretty similar age yeah. to um, me with regards to when you started, actually. I started when I was about seven or eight playing um, classic diamond cricket in school. Yeah. <laughs> It is the classic. So, um, it's the best game ever still. Brilliant. Exactly. I, I agree with that, yeah. We should introduce it a bit more at the clubs. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, in those early days, Matt, okay, obviously you've, you've grown up as a batsman who can bowl as well. Who were your early cricketing inspirations back then in those early days? Um, oh, good question. I think um, really early on, like I remember going down to Sussex Cricket Club when I was about... 10, 11, 12, watching the games. Uh, and there was the likes of Michael Yardy coming through, Maya, <clears throat> Carl Hopkinson. Um, and those guys were still coaching sort of the um, genius stuff of that. Young. So I kind of looked up to those guys really well with Chris Adam, Murray Goodwin, James Kirtley, um, uh, and stuff like that. So they were my earliest um, memories. Um, and then when I was probably about 15, uh, 2005 Ashes, Kevin Peterson, debut series. That's when I really, really got into cricket, I'd say, properly. And I was like, right, this is what I want to do for as long as possible, playing it professionally. And, and my goal was kind of shifted to trying to be a pro. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my earliest memories and how I got into cricket. Um, but going down to Sussex in the summer holidays, uh, watching 50 over stuff, uh, four day stuff, loved it. Loved it. Yeah, there was a uh, pattern with a couple of those choices as well. Michael Yard and Kevin Pete, some very powerful hitters of the ball. I mean, when they hit the yeah. ball, the ball stayed hit. So, <laughs> yeah, very, very good inspirations to have back then. And um, talking of your batting, Matt, OK, because this is something that's quite interesting, OK? You bat left-handed and bowl right-handed, a bit like Jimmy Anderson, I suppose. What actually, what's the inspiration behind that? What made you choose to, to play like that? Honest question, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I, 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 I'm am, I guess I'm ambidextrous, so um, my bottom half of my body, if I was to kick a football or a rugby ball, I'd do it left-footed. And if I was to write or, or throw or do anything with my upward, it's for my right hand. Um, so it's quite strange, really. Um, I don't really know why I was left-handed. I remember picking up a bat <coughs> when I was younger. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and um, he used to hold it like a left-handed grip, but stand right-handed. Uh, and then my coach just switched me around to being left-handed. And it kind of just went from there, really. Um, so I don't really know how I got into it. I think it's quite natural. But I'm surprised looking back now, considering that I coached, that I wasn't sort of taught how to throw left-handed or back right-handed. Um, yeah, I don't really know. It's, it's a strange one, considering now, as I said, my upper body's right side dominant, and her body's left side dominant. So I don't know. Well, yeah, it's, it's strange. I mean, nothing wrong with it, I suppose. It proved to be quite effective, as we'll see later with the stats. But, um, yeah, just found that quite interesting about your game, obviously. And as, as we've been watching the test matches recently with Jimmy Anderson, just mind me of that, really. But, <laughs> yeah, cool, though. I mean, I wish I, I could be so ambidextrous. I... Right. The strangest ones, though, are when people bat right-handed, bowl left-handed, and then throw right-handed. Liam Dawson's an example from England uh, and Hampshire. He bats right-handed and throws right-handed, but he bowls left arm. Strange. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> Works for him, though. He is, he is a pretty good yeah. off-spinner, yeah. Exactly. exactly. 100%. Yeah. 
And, um, well, talking of Hampshire and uh, Sussex and county cricket, obviously those two have a rivalry, don't they? El Classic Coast, okay. What was yes. your favourite memory from that fixture as a Sussex player? They're always good fixtures, you know. There's always like a derby build-up before it. Um, my, best, my best memory from it would be um, probably 2015. We played at the Rose Bowl. And we, Hampshire got 180, I think. And we were 10 for three. Um, and I came into bat with Craig Kachopa, um, a chap from New Zealand. And we put on 170 and won the game. We won three down inside 18 overs. I think I got about 60 not out and Craig got 90 not out. And it was just one of those games where we went out to bat and we had nothing to lose. Um, and yeah, it's just an unbelievable memory. But being 10 for three and then winning it. Yeah, it was pretty good. And we had, a, we had a, like a rock star 11 as well that time. We had um, Hayley Jar Warden was playing, George Bailey, I think, as well. Mike Chiardi. Yeah, to be 10 for three and win it from that position is amazing. Yeah, definitely. I was actually going to bring that up, funny enough. I did that in my, um, in my background research. I was going to bring up that game. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, as I said, obviously a very proud moment for any Sussex fans. It's always nice to win your local derby, isn't it, really? But, um, yeah, Sussex aside and county cricket aside, I think the, the team that you're most known for playing for is Scotland, isn't it, really? I mean, you produced some fantastic performances with your time up for Scotland. But first of all, what made you play for Scotland? Because you were born in Brighton, you've grown up in England. What made you decide to make the move to Scotland? Um, I, I always wanted to play for Scotland. So uh, a lot of people don't know, but my mum was born in Scotland and lived down. I moved to Brighton when she was around 15, 16. So her side of the family is still up there. Uh, and when I found out I could qualify, or I've been trying to qualify for a number of years, and the passport system, because at the time, but well, still now, uh, it's UK passport. So I couldn't get a Scottish passport or anything. So the ICC actually changed the rules to make it uh, more beneficial. Uh, teams like Scotland, Holland, uh, Canada, people like that. So you could get to play for Scotland on sort of an ancestral uh, they call it an ancestral visa, ancestral passport, essentially. So that's how I managed to qualify. But I wanted to try and play for Scotland three, four, five years before I could. I wanted to play in the old-fashioned Pro 40 um, <laughs> when I first got into Sussex. Because I was never playing at Sussex at that time. I was sort of on the staff. But because we had such a strong 11, I was never playing. So I wanted to play for Scotland in, at that time to get experience. But even before that, I tried to play when I was 19, when I was 17. So I wanted to go to these World Cups, you see, these, uh, the ICC events and things like that. So I've been trying for a while. So when I found out I could actually play, it was quite a relief. And it's, a nice, it's a nice feeling because although, looking back, look, I probably classify myself as an Englishman with Scottish heritage. But obviously, I'm extremely proud of that Scottish side of my family. And to be able to have played as I did for Scotland for so long, it was, it was really nice. Yeah, that's how I qualified. Oh, fair enough. Fans, yeah, to say the least, it paid off. I mean, let's just have a look at these stats. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, 734 runs scored for Scotland in one day international cricket, which is the 10th highest in Scotland's history. And at 407 runs at an average of 40.7 in T20i cricket, the seventh leading run score for Scotland in T20 internationals. What would you say was your proudest moment or your highlight from your time with Scotland? A tough one. That's a tough one. Um, I think, obviously, qualifying for two World Cups. Um, 2015 World Cup in Australia was a, a magnificent event to go and do that and, and experience it. And also the 2016 World Cup in India. To see how cricket crazy they are in India and, 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 and the passion behind it. But I think my, my debut game against Afghanistan in Dubai in 2012 or 13. Um, but the one, but the one that sticks uh, to my memory is when we played Kenya, in the 2014 ICC qualifier, to actually qualifies for the 2015 World Cup. We lost our first game in that tournament, um, at, and we went on a run of sort of seven out of seven out of eight to get to this stage, and we beat Kenya to qualify for the World Cup. But if we had a lot, of, um, a lot of the guys who were Scottish based at the time would have essentially lost their jobs because the ICC would have cut the funding. Um, so looking back now, I didn't quite realise the pressure that was involved on those guys. So they're playing for their livelihood. I was lucky when I had a contract with Sussex. So essentially, I was still going to be fine for a, a livelihood. But those guys looking back, the pressure they went on under for that period of time 
was phenomenal. And, and to qualify as a team from uh, coming, losing our first game and, and qualifying, I think our coach left two or three weeks before that tournament because we didn't qualify for the 2020 World Cup when we should have done in Dubai a few months earlier. So the build-up uh, for that was just that, that whole sort of six, seven-week period in New Zealand was just fantastic qualifying. I mean, I think it kind of started the belief that the guys are now experiencing now. Yeah, definitely. And, um, well, let's talk about that 2015 World Cup for a moment, OK? Because obviously you played England in that tournament, didn't you? I mean, that was... <laughs> yeah, we did. How did you I find stretched, that? that was it. Uh, well, it's a real experience because I knew most of the guys haven't played quite a bit with them in county cricket against the normal women. It was quite weird, really. Uh, but it was actually a lot closer game than I remember because England were doing, weren't doing great at the time. They'd just lost to, I think, maybe Bangladesh before or, or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, I remember Mo and Ali got 100 and it was just an amazing game. There were so many fans there. It was sold out. It was brilliant. Great experience. And, and we lost by about 60 or 70 runs, I think. Maybe a few more, but just the whole day was, uh, it was yeah, it wasn't a great tournament for England, though. So we'll, we'll probably skip <laughs> over 2015. My goodness. I mean, the, the two in particular, the New Zealand game in, in Wellington when Tim Zalzi, I think he got seven for 33, just yeah. tore through us. And then obviously the loss to Bangladesh. Oh, yeah, that was a pretty bad tournament for England, to be honest. But um, yeah, moving on to the next year, which was the T20 World Cup in India, as you mentioned, you, you produced a fantastic performance against Hong Kong. I think let's focus in on that one in Nagpur. Mm -hmm. What do you remember from that day? Um, trying to finish on a high in the tournament. Scotland had never previously won a World Cup game, so that was a big talking point. We sort of said that, you know, it's kind of our chance to, I guess, get the monkey off the back and essentially win a game at a World Cup. I know they tried for many years and hadn't for whatever reason. So, so that was a big motivating factor. We had, we had previously beaten Hong Kong uh, prior to that quite a few times. Um, but I remember it was a very, very rain-affected game. Yeah. Um, Ian Gould was umpire, and Ian Gould's son, Mike, is actually one of my best friends. So uh, I remember him just giving me loads of stick before the game and, and things like that. So, um, so, so yeah, so I remember it. And then rain-affected, we bowled first on a slow wicket, but maybe kept it to about 120, and then it rained, the rain was coming. So uh, I think we had to chase maybe 70 or 80 or seven or eight overs. We got off to a fantastic start, and then... Um, and then, yeah, I was lucky enough to be the one that sort of uh, finished the job for everyone, hit the winning run, which, looking back now, was a really nice moment. Yeah, it was a cracking shot as well, wasn't it? I think you sent it double double deck. It was a double decker, wasn't it, against uh, Nadim Ahmed? Yeah, it was a cracking so. shot. <laughs> really was. And all the celebrations as well. You just saw the Scotland dugout, everyone together, the likes of Kurtzer, DeLang, you had Preston Momsen, all those guys who had obviously... Well, never experienced the feeling of winning an ICC tournament. So, yeah, that was fantastic, wasn't it, really? What a day for Scottish cricket. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Looking back, it's, that as well, I forgot to say that. Yeah, that's probably another memory that's amazing to me as well. So, I'd definitely go into sort of the top three or four moments, for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you had, you had more, though. I mean, let's not forget the 114 against Kenya, um, which was your highest ever score as well. That was at Manorfield Park in Aberdeen. Beautiful ground. I mentioned that yeah. on my um, Safian Sharif podcast as well. Beautiful ground up there. But, um, yeah, looking back, let's take the proudest moments aside now, Matt. What would you say was your toughest moment with your time in Scotland? Um, oh, toughest moment. That's sorry, another question. I think the thing I found tough to start with, if I'm brutally honest, is Coming in from quite a professional environment at Sussex and being around, I'm going to say, high-class quality international players whose standards are up here the whole time. Coming in sort of what felt like quite a club team at the time and not clashing heads, but trying to do it professionally. And you had the younger guys who were kind of maybe more on board than the older guys who potentially weren't. So that, I found that tough to start with, getting used to it, because um, I didn't want to come in like a big-time Charlie when I never played or only played a few games. Um, so I found that a little bit tough to start with, but 2014 qualifier uh, against um, uh, the whole tournament in Dubai. Uh, we had played brilliant cricket and we didn't get, we didn't calculate the correct run rate we needed. We actually came, I think it was ninth out of the group and it was the top eight went through uh, to the 2014 or 15, 2020 World Cup, whatever it was. So those two were tough moments and they were tough. Um, but yeah, apart from those two, my, my memories of Scotland are pretty good, really. 
uh, seeing the whole transition, to, I guess, amateur or part-time cricket to full-time is quite nice. But yeah, not too many uh, bad memories, mainly positive. Well, that's a lovely thing to say, and obviously that, that just proves testament to how good Scottish cricket's become over the past few years. Obviously, they've got their ODI status as well. That's now nice and secure. And they're going to be at the next T20 World Cup. I mean, yeah, the the difference between, let's say, the Scotland of, of the late 2000s to now is is measurable, isn't it, really? Massive change, which is good. I think that's why they're doing so well now. I think it's been beautifully led by Carl Kirk and the management and all these younger guys playing then. They've grown into sort of uh, experienced cricketers now. And you can see the results are just sort of take care of themselves now, I guess. Uh, the, the associates and obviously they're challenging uh, full member teams now as well, which is brilliant. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, love the Scots. Hope they do well at the next <laughs> World Cup. Definitely. <laughs> I wish them the very best of luck. Yeah, I've, I've had half the team on the podcast so far. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah they love a podcast, the Scottish lads. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Well, they've they've proven that. But yeah. <laughs> right, Matt, let's talk about now. Arguably, the toughest moment of your of your cricket career. Okay the end okay the premature sure. retirement now now this was a massive shame i remember this at the time it was a shame obviously for sussex fans and for scotland fans first of all how did you find out about the injury and, and how did you kind of cope with it so i played i came back from the 2016 world cup um after a pretty good 18 months in sussex and scotland and i was kind of um, doing well um starting the four day team and was doing okay and then 2020 was coming and I remember we were playing at Derby and it was rain affected, but we had a T20 game against Gloucester on Friday night. I played a pull shot on the next and I got a sharp pain in my left wrist. Didn't think anything of it because uh, the amount we play in county cricket, you just sort of, you get injuries and you have to sort of get on with it essentially. Um, and then that played that game and it got worse and worse on the Friday night and just kept getting worse and worse. And it wasn't until I was at home about, I think maybe a month later because it was painful but the physios were aware and I was aware but it wasn't like anything to stop me playing and, the, and one night I was at home and my girlfriend um, turned around to me and said your hand's massive and my left hand had literally swollen I feel like I had one of those massive thumb hands you know you see it um, at the cricket yeah. it literally looked massive um, so I went to the physio and they said look something's not right here they sent me for an x-ray um, and a uh, Few scans and they just said I had too much tissue in my wrist at the time. Um, so I had a few steroid injections, played the 2020 season. So I could manage playing one day, but I couldn't play sort of two, three, four days consecutively. Uh, my wrist just wouldn't do it. So um, end of the season, had an operation, was trying to come back um, and just couldn't. Every time I tried to bat or every time I tried to build my hand, would just completely go. So I was advised in sort of May, June time, nine, ten months later, saying, look, you continue to play or try, your wrist is going to completely go. Completely go. And, at, and at the time, I looked and thought, well, 25, 26, uh, I prefer to have a healthy wrist than potentially cause long term damage. So it's been frustrating. Obviously, it was very, very tough to take. It's probably taken me two, two and a half, three years to get over it, really, because it wasn't like I wasn't good enough to do it. My career was only sort of rising, which is a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. But now I've paid for myself to go and see specialists to see if I can get it fixed. And um, they've all turned around and said no. So the wrist structure I have at the moment is a wrist of someone who's 65 to 70. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, if I was 45, I would have a complete wrist, repla wrist replacement. But I'm too young and the technology is not good enough. So I'm booked in for an operation to get all my nerves cut in my wrist, which will hopefully stem the pain and hopefully by sort of 10 15 years uh that's when the operation will sort of not work anymore and therefore i can essentially um potentially have a full wrist replacement so yeah so um it was the right decision to retire uh, definitely but obviously it's taken me two years for me in my own mind to kind of go through all the surgeons and the specialists to make sure it definitely was so yeah, bitter, bitter pill, but it, 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 is, it was tough. It's a lot better now, but yeah, it's a shame that it is what it is now. Well, yeah, well, first things first, I wish you the very best of luck with that. I really do. I, I really do hope that you can get that sorted. Because, I mean, even for me, as I said, I, and I know Scotland fans, 
and that 2016, they still talk about that to this day. And I, I imagine knowing Scotland fans, they'll talk about it for many years later as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, and as I said, it, it was kind of hard for Scotland fans as well because you were an excellent player. A 40 batting average in T20 international cricket yeah. is incredible. But at the same yeah. time, I think you made the right decision. Obviously, long-term health is more important. Yeah. And not only that, you left the game as, as an absolute stud. So... <laughs> I, I wouldn't take it too personally, to be honest, Matt. I mean, you made the right decision thinking about your long-term health and you left the game on a high, I think, especially giving the Scotland fans something to remember for the rest of their lives. But um, obviously, professional cricket aside, you then found the determination to find, um, to form Precise Cricket, which obviously is something that I've been watching. I've been following you on there for a number of months now. What's the inspiration behind the, the formation of uh, Precise Cricket? So when I, well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, bit, the quick background so you can understand it. So I was, um, when I retired, I hated cricket, fell out of love with the game. Um, and then uh, 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 what turned out to be my level three uh, mentor coach said, come do some work for me, Mike Smethurst. Um, he got me back into coaching and said, look, do as much and as little as you want. Um, but you know, don't, sort of, don't sort of throw cricket away because cricket is giving me everything, which it has. So I formed Precise Cricket in 2018, um, uh, just to sort of do one-to-ones, uh, small courses out of, and things like that. Um, that year, I, an old colleague, Rob Taylor from Scotland, got in touch, and I ended up working uh, as assistant coach and batting coach for Love for Lightning in the Women's Super League uh, for nine months. Absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, then got a job with Love for MCCU for six months, but the travel after a while was just too much to go back on. So, uh, so for the last year, um, uh, I've been mainly been well, I've been working for myself, coaching sort of one to ones, um, you know, the, the usual stuff, masterclasses, courses, and things like that. But uh, in the last sort of three four months, I've I guess I've started to form a social media presence, um, which is nice. Um, been putting a lot of effort into that. But essentially, what precise cricket is, I want to give back and give experiences to players that have never had. Or will never have had or will never experienced the experiences I've had, uh, whether you're 10 or 55, 60, the amount of knowledge I've personally acquired and the amount of people I guess I know within the game, I want to be able to deliver what essentially a professional does to an amateur player and kind of go that way in a business direction because having coached quite a lot of club cricket as a senior coach and and kids in there, they look up to professionals. It doesn't matter what age you are, yep. they want to understand and experience what players do. I've luckily enough done it. Uh, I have friends that you know, want to come aboard and I guess be ambassadors, which is exciting stuff moving forward. And, and that's where I want to go, but I want to be able to give back and give an insight into what pros do. And um, yeah, it's, so far, it's uh, the last three, four months when I've had, a, I guess, a bit more direction and what I want to do and give back. So it's been received quite well so far. Yeah, definitely. And um, I was looking, obviously, on your website. You've, well, I didn't have to look on the website for Phil Salt. I was watching you <laughs> practice with him in the helmet the other day. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Phil Salt, George Adams, who obviously played for the Lightning as well. Delray Wallins, who's a fantastic young player from Sussex, the, the Bermudian. He's a, he's a wonderful young player, isn't he? Lovely, yeah. Brilliant player. But, uh, yeah, obviously, with your time at Precise Cricket, what's been your, what's been your favourite aspect of coaching? I like being able to see someone improve and develop. Um, I, like, I like seeing someone at one point. It doesn't matter where they're playing club second team. If someone's genuinely investing their time and their interest to try and improve and develop, it might take them six months, it might take them a year. But I like seeing that person put the time in and get the rewards later down the line. Um, you, know, when, you know, I've done work with, as I said, Phil Saul, Delray, Harry Finch and people like that give them a bit of information they take it on board and you can see it quite quickly but being able to do that with someone potentially not as talented uh, is still quite rewarding it just takes longer to get to that process yeah definitely and a great um, mindset to have as a coach obviously you're, you're constantly looking to improve obviously your, your students really but um, on the flip side what's your least favorite aspect of coaching <laughs> uh, coaching in the rain hate it but it's got to be done at times um, and I've kind of stopped it now, but uh, when parents used to drop their kids off as a babysitting service, that <laughs> used to that used to wire me up. Um, but uh, I've kind of avoided that now. I kind of 
I want to see wits without the parents that do that, which is good. I mean, I, I want to work with, with, with kids that essentially want to improve and want to get better themselves and they want to go and actively do it rather than their mum and dad saying, do you know what, there's a cricket camp or there's a bloke doing one-to-ones down the road. I'm just going to drop you there for an hour. They don't want to be there, but the parents just want an hour's break. So I've kind of just whittled them out, uh, which is quite nice. And I think people know that now. So it's made my job a lot easier because I can actually yep. coach what I want to do rather than trying to look after someone for an hour, which just send them to the crash or down the park. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Fair play. I mean, you've got to do, what, obviously, what's best for, for yourself, and you, really? Yeah. Cheeky parents. God. I know, I know. Shocking. But, um, yeah, talking of your coaching, okay, Matt, obviously this is something nice, ask this in every single podcast. What advice would you give to any young cricketers out there? So let's say you've got a young batsman or batter in the women's game who are maybe just starting out their career. What advice would you give to them? They say one, but it's enjoy it. If you're yeah. not enjoying it, there's no point doing it. But a good bit of advice I've got, which I now like to pass on, is yes, it's good to listen to a coach, but make sure you play the way you want to play rather than the way someone tells you to play. So if you want to run down the wicket first ball, go and do it. It's a game. I mean, it's as simple as that, really, for me. Do it how you want to do it, not how someone else perceives you should be doing it. Yes, listen to coaches. They do have experience and advice, but don't have to take on board go and play how you want to play um, and, and and enjoy doing it your way as opposed to someone else that's the best bit of advice i've received and i like to pass on yeah that was chris nash that. actually chris nash uh, oh, wow. not yeah. yeah 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 he said that to me actually when he said to me uh i think it was before 2020 finals day uh go and play the way you want to play. and then we had another conversation a few months later and he said look we have to stop playing tomorrow stop playing the game and look back and think, yeah, I played it how I want to play it. Do it your way, rather than how someone else wants to do it. And it stuck with me, and it's kind of a motto I've had a little bit in my career now. A great motto that I kind of like to pass on. Whether he remember remember saying that is another thing with Nashi. But um, yeah, a great <laughs> bit of advice that I've always sort of remembered. Well, yeah, and it is good advice. Obviously, we see that in the professional game as well, don't we? From the likes of Shivan Ryan Chandapur, you've got Dom Sibley and Roy Burns in the England squad now who are anything but orthodox but they get the job done don't they and they play exactly their way so great advice i think that matt and um yeah to kind of wrap up the podcast really one final question what does the future have in store for mr matt machen i over the next six to 12 to 18 months in the short term i really want to push precise as a brand uh, not just in sussex but all over the uk and potentially expand overseas um I like to offer people uh, my experiences, um, not, not just limiting myself. Um, you know, I've got a few exciting things with Precise that are getting launched over the next few months, which is cool. Um, but yeah, just just to, just just to, just to really grow the brand, um, and yeah, hopefully over the next eighteen to sort of next three to five years, I've got some cool things in my mind that I want to do. Um, but essentially, just to give back. If I keep giving back and helping people out, then uh, it's, it's, the business is going to grow anyway, and, and that's what I'm going to achieve. Definitely. And you know what, Matt? I wish you the very best of luck with it. I really do. Obviously, I like I like precise crickets cracking. <laughs> I thoroughly recommend it on Instagram. And also, just to kind of wrap up, would you like to obviously plug the social media for that, the Twitter, the Instagram handles, for example? Yeah, so if, if any of you want to uh, follow me or look at the content that I, I give out, it's just precise cricket on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So it's pretty easy to remember. Um, but yeah, um, if anyone's got any questions or anything like that, then send me a, a message and I'll happily answer them. Yeah, definitely. I'll be putting the links down to those in the description below on the YouTube video. So if you want to go find that, please feel free. I thoroughly recommend it. But um, yeah, all that's left to say on my side, Max, thank you very much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's, great. it's been absolutely great talking to you about <laughs> cricket and coaching and all sorts of, of things about the general world of cricket. And so all those who have listened to the podcast, thank you as always for tuning in. As always, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>